Hello ladies and gentlemen, here we go again, continuing our coverage of the 1996 FIDE World Championship uh, match held in Elista between Anatoly Karpov and Gada Kamsky. And uh, we left off on Game 7, which ended in a, a devastating uh, defeat um, for Gada Kamsky. And now Karpov... Um, had led uh, hard for a draw, uh, Kamsky had the white pieces um game started out as a Karo Khan uh the Smyslov uh um uh, I think it's like Smyslov Petrosian uh is credited with this system here but needless to say um Karpov was able to uh maintain a draw uh even though Kamsky had some uh pressure resulting in um Karpov uh, getting an isolated pawn uh, in the position but uh, I just want to get you you know fast forward through these moves if there's an isolated pawn that arose on the board so Kamsky has some chances and um, in this position right here um, I mean Possibly somebody, you know, with like better end game technique, like like a, um, even Karpov, if Karpov had the white pieces, or perhaps, um, you know, somebody like Capablanca, or somebody um, like that, probably uh, wins wins this uh, ending right here. Um, typically, uh, all your the technique required, um, and of course you can find this in uh, Alicon games or Capablanca games. Is basically you maintain the pressure on the D pawn, you know, of course, tying up all the defensive pieces, and then you want to create a second weakness, and that's where you would advance those pawns on the uh, king side against the, the open lines against the black king. And then basically, uh, at the uh, right time, you're going to use your greater mobility to start uh, switching your attacks, and then in theory. Black is not supposed to be able to withstand that second front uh, being open. But, um, you know, Kasky made some errors and uh, Karpov was able to um, get away uh, with a, a draw here. So this had been, um, you know, Kamsky's, uh you know, luck in this match. That uh, besides uh, <clears throat> his win in uh, game two, I believe, uh, it's been uh, all downhill. And as you can see, Kamsky with the white pieces did try to open up a second front on the king side, but uh, Karpov's technique was too strong, and he gained too much counterplay, and eventually the game ended in a perpetual check. So that uh, brings us to the beginning of uh, Game 9. And in Game 9, Anatoly Karpov has the white pieces. And um, I just wanted to mention some... Uh, a little bit of uh, background after game eight had ended in the draw uh Gada's father uh rustam kamsky had asked for a press conference and by this time it's starting to look like a blowout karpov is up a five and a half to two and a half so uh Gada kamsky's father asked for a press conference and um now basically he started uh complaining you know about you know um uh, conditions now in the match and it seems like um you know you know a common tactic when one player is having trouble to basically create you know some type of distractions and so basically in the computer room uh two uh, russian gms uh vasyukov and um uh, gagarin well international master gagarin were preparing the comments for the spectators and so um, Rustam Kamsky came in the computer room and was suspicious and accused those two, uh, of working for Karpov. And, uh, and basically to corroborate this, he said Karpov 
had broken his normal routine as he was leaving the stage a lot during the play. So kind of reminds us of uh, Toilet Gate a little bit, right, with uh, Kramnik and uh, uh, Vesel and to uh, Top Topalov, you know, with the uh, leaving, uh, you know, the stage during the play. Um, so basically, you know, this was so this was like a little distraction. And then the match had been 20 games and... He felt he he tried to uh, get the match extended to 24 games to give Gata more of a chance to uh, come back, and the reason why he felt justified in this is he said that he only officially quote received the regulations of the match uh, yesterday, which was a, a, right before game eight. So he was basically saying he didn't have any regulations. So now that he has them, 20 games is is too short, and he wants 24 games now. So it's just a little background of some of the stuff that was <laughs> some of the drama that was going on. All right, so let's go. Let's do game eight. Uh, excuse me, game nine. Now Karpov has the white pieces. Kamsky, black pieces. D4, knight of six. C4, G6, knight C3. And Gata returns to his um, initial um, opening for the match, his, his mainstay, which was the uh, Grunfeld. Knight f3, bishop g7, queen b3, and Karpov plays his Russian system, which we discussed earlier. Queen takes c4, castles, e4. And, of course, what we, we explained before, if you've been following the match, um, and, of course, you can check the playlist, is that uh, this system, if you notice the odd thing about it from the white perspective, is that the queen is on c4. And... So this is basically uh, White's, um, you know, kind of the uh, fly in the ointment, so to speak, for White's position. If you could take the queen and, say, put it on e2 and take the light square bishop on f1 and put it on c4, uh, boy, you have a, a fantastic position. But since the queen is somewhat exposed, this allows black to create a counterplay against the uh, white center. And, and you'll see it in these games. So black tends to get uh, dynamic in these positions because he has to, he can't afford to wait, waste any time attacking that center. So e5, there's b5 hitting the queen, knight of d7. And now bishop e3. Now um, e6 was played in the third, in the third game um, by Karpov, but here... He plays bishop e3. c5. And this was at the time kind of like a, a sideline. More common is knight b6 here. So c5. Now e6. And c4. If f takes e6. That looks ugly right? If f takes e6. Then queen takes e6. King h8. And queen e4 or uh, queen d5 are, are both possible. And um, it's good for white. So c4 was played. E takes f7. Rook takes f7. Queen d1. And notice how the queen has to keep moving around. That's part of the price of, of playing the Russian system. And hopefully uh, black hopes to utilize the time gained. Right? In an uh, uh, economical matter to get all of his pieces in play. Knight b6. And now knight e5 from Karpov. At the time, this move, knight e5, was a novelty. Back in 96. The old theory was uh, began with the move a4. Attacking this pawn. b4. Knight e4. A5, and then white will play knight, uh, knight E5, rook F8, knight takes C4, knight D5, and bishop E2, and white had an advantage in this position. Okay, this that was from the game uh, Portish uh, Ribley from 1971. So knight e5 was a novelty at the time. And remember, this is kind of pre-engine era. This is kind of uh, the time when 
test computers were kind of first starting to be, you know, filter into uh, top level competition. So Rook F Rook F8. Um, just on the surface, this looks bad. Just giving up that strong bishop. But just in case you wanted to know, bishop takes e5 is bad after d takes e5. And let, let us say queen takes rook d1. And then black uh, is just simply losing uh, material here. Things are just hanging. This bishop, I mean, excuse me, this uh, this knight is hanging right here. And uh, what to do? If he goes back here, the pawn pushes on uh, e6. So that's just dubious. So rook f8 was played. A4. A5 from Karpov. If knight e4. A5. That transposes right into that uh, Portish Ribley game. And again, white has a, an advantage here, a plus. But Karpov decided to go into a, a, another direction. Instead of playing, moving the knight first, he decided to just press forward with a5. Now this is forced b takes c3, a takes b6, c takes b2, bishop takes c4 check, king moves, rook b1, queen takes b6, and now queen d2. Okay. And now um as you can see white is starting to maintain uh excuse me not maintain um uh, obtain a serious lead in development. So all white needs to do is castle and he wants to capture that pawn on B2. And this combined his lead in development combined with uh, that shaky raggedy looking pawn structure that black has that should prove to be decisive knight d7 was played rook takes b2 so there's one objective down there goes the pawn knight takes e5 from gata so in this position gata is sacrificing his queen okay notice rook takes b2 the queen is on priest and uh he hopes that the uh, rook uh bishop you know, that he's remaining with and this strong A pawn will uh, be, um, you know, sufficient compensation. The reason why he did it is because after Rook takes B2, now he's not forced to sacrifice his queen, but he just felt he was going to have a worse position. So if Queen C7, for instance, then Knight here, F7, King G8, and then just simply Rook C2, this protects the bishop here and threatens with all kind of uh, knight moves. You know, where the, wherever that knight uh, retreats. Instead of queen c7, if queen f6, white can go on with f4. Let's say knight b6. Drop the bishop back. a5. And castle. And white is just better here too. It's with this powerful knight on the e5. Another try is queen d6. Again, this is worse than the uh, last continuation as uh, white gladly takes the exchange. And then this attempt to trap the bishop fails after bishop e8, knight b6, and then just queen b4. So this gives you a little insight on why Gata felt that it was time to give up the queen. So knight takes e5 was played, rook takes b6, knight takes c4, queen b4, knight takes b6, queen takes b6, and a5. So this is what uh, Gata has envisioned as uh, compensation. Having the bishop pair, two rooks, and then this outside a pawn. And this is what he's banking everything on here. Castle, a4, rook a1, bishop f5, h4, 
And the reason behind this move is that um, it it's, it uh, takes away any kind of counterplay that Black might have dealing with the back rank later on. So just pushing this pawn up, creating the air for the king. All right. Now, again, as I always say, uh, these grandmasters and masters in general, strong players, and you'll start to play like this one day too. You you study and work hard enough. Is the moves are economical. So I just gave you again the surface reason. Surface reason behind the move is okay. Just creating some air for the king. But again, with these masters, there's often more than one reason behind the move. The second reason is that it prepares to open up the king side. You know, uh, in the offensive matter uh, when needed. E6. Um, this move, of course, all pawn moves leave some kind of weakness behind. So immediately the squares uh, D6 and F6 uh, became uh, weakened as well as the 7th rank in general. Bishop F4. This takes the uh, B8 square away from one of the rooks. And again, dual possibility. Bishop e5, right, to exchange the dark square bishops and exposing the king. Because we know if the dark square bishops is are gone, all of these dark squares are weak around the uh, black king. Bishop e4 now. So he's gonna, he's just relocating this bishop. Bishop d6. And this is just a domination theme because now the bishop is all in the neighborhood. Attacking the rook. They just take it, you know, just taking away more squares from white. Uh from black. Sorry about that. After bishop d6, rook f c eight. Queen b five. Again, double entendre here, right? Double meaning. The first is rook just a simple rook takes a four. And the second is bishop e5 again with the uh, idea of exchanging the bishops. Bishop c6. Queen b4. King g8. And now rook a3. So now again... You probably can see the perp. You're starting to get the hang of it, right? You can see now. You can see the uh, uh, the double. You know, sometimes the move will have a uh, triple purpose to it. But here you can see one his blockading the pawn, right? That's the obvious. You know what's on on the table right in front of you. He's blockading the pawn from advancing, maintaining the pressure, right? You can see all of that stuff, maintaining the pressure on the the a pawn. But the second the second idea is to be able to swing that rook over. On the third rank and attack the king when it when it's time. <clears throat> Rook a6. Okay, and now here Gata just blunders. And you might be able to see this like real easily. Just look at the light squares now. Look at the e6 pawn. Now you can see what the problem is. Boom, double attack. Queen c4. Rook c a8. Queen takes e6. King h8. Bishop e5. And there, now here's this plan we've been talking about. Now the bishop's got to go. Bishop takes. And now uh, God is dead lost here. And we'll just uh, go through the moves rather quickly. Here comes the assault on the king. That's a deadly move to deal with. H6. Rook 6, A7, D5. So now that the black's pieces are all tied down, now it's, you can just push the pawn now. Rook B7. D6. And sorry about that's the wrong move. Now actually what 
was played. And after, uh, it's funny because some sources have the the move Rook D7. Like if you look the game up on the internet, you might see the move Rook D7, and some have the sources as Rook D8. Now both of the the thing that's funny is both moves lose to the same move. So the source I have has Rook, uh, actually Rook, actually Rook D8. So after Rook D8. Sorry about that. After Rook D8, Karpov played Rook F3, and um, Komsky was forced to resign. It's going to be mate in five, actually. All right, and basically it's just threatening Queen H8. That's the threat. Queen H8. Yeah, we might as well uh, just make some kind of random move. And so this would stop the immediate queen h8, but let's make an even dumber move. Queen h8, king h8, and then that would be checkmate. That that mate reminded me of uh I forgot what game it was between um, Petrosi and Spassky. Actually, uh yeah, Petrosi had the uh, the black pieces. Spassky has the white pieces, and, um, or was it the other way? No, no, Petrosian, that's right, it was the King's Indian. Petrosian had the, uh, white pieces, and, uh, Sp and, uh, Spassky had the black pieces, and he played this similar, similar idea, this Queen H8, except he had, he had a knight involved, though, and fought, wind up forking the Queen, but he did the same thing, sacrifice his Queen on H8 to drive the King into that corner. And it, then there was a knight coming to check on F7, and then there was a queen here. But, um, so that was it. Devastating uh, loss. Bad loss for Kamsky. And that was in, like, his bread and butter with the black pieces. So, basically, at this point in the match, he was running out of, um, uh, uh, places to run, so to speak. And, um, so, because he, he went from, uh, Grunfeld, and he tried King's Indian, um, Nimzo Indian is play basically he's running out of places to, to, you know, hide from, uh, you know, from Karpov. It's like everything that he was trying, Karpov was, was figuring it out at this point. So now the match is, uh, you know, pretty much, uh, becoming a massacre. So with that, um, we're going to end this, this video right here. I hope it was instructive for you. Please like, subscribe, and definitely consider, uh, donating if, if these videos are, um, you know, um, pleasurable to you. And um, I'll see you on the next video. We're going to, um, you know, go through the whole match. All right. And again, if you need to find something, just go to the uh, playlist and, and everything's in order. All right. See you later.